talk, we're fortunate to have Susanna Malconian Altschuler. She's a, a graduate student, um, ABD, on her, at the University of Connecticut, and she's going to be talking about minimalism today. So, screen's yours. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. I'm going to talk about the dependency intuition that you have probably already um, have an impression of in my abstract and the question how the minimalist can account for dependency, the idea that truth depends on reality and not the other way around. So I would like to start with a quote from Aristotle where he makes a distinction between implication and dependency. And uh, as for implication, he says in the categories, for there being a man reciprocates as to implication of existence with the true statement about it. If there is a man, the statement whereby we say that there is a man is true. And in turn, if the statement whereby we say that there is a man is true, there is a man. So Aristotle presents implication as a symmetric relation. P is true implies P, and P implies P is true. And he's really interested in distinguishing implication or the symmetric kind of implication from what people nowadays call dependency. Here's what he says in his own words about the issue. He says, and whereas the true statement is in no way the cause of the actual thing's existence, the actual thing does seem in some way the cause of the statements being true. It is because the actual thing exists or does not that the statement is called true or false. So of course there is no literal sense in which statements or that truth is caused by things in the world. But the idea here is that, that we are thinking about a cross-categorical relationship between truth and reality. And uh, people call this dependency because another way of putting the issue that's different than implication is to say um, truths are made true in virtue of things in the world. And people differ on what things make things true, but yeah, the, the important thing is that there's a metaphysical relationship between things in the world, say chunks of reality and truths. As we also can see uh, that he's using a uh, formulation in terms of because, that dependency is an asymmetric explanatory relationship. Right? The proposition that P is true because P, because something in the world is a certain way. So the proposition snow is white is true because snow is white, but he doesn't seem to accept that we could say snow is white because the proposition that snow is white is true. So there is this asymmetry in um, independency, which is, as I said, characterized also in terms of because statement. What I like um, to call directionality because I really think it brings out the fact that we are not thinking primarily about uh, relations between statements, but this cross-categorical relationship. And I like to talk about directionality to make clear that what's at issue here with the dependency intuition is a, a, that there's a direction of explanation and the direction of explanation is always from reality to truth and never from truth to reality. That's why my title is also directionality for minimalism. Just making that clear. So now it looks like um, the biconditional is going to be a problem for minimalism and accounting for dependency, which is a explanatory asymmetry of relationship. As we know, minimalism is the view that all there is to a theory of truth are the instances of the following equivalence schema, E, the proposition P is true if and only if P. So there's this problem of directionality because if and only if implies by directionality. So if P is true then P and the other way around P, if P then P is true. So we have this bi-directionality. But um, dependency is directional as we know, or as I've tried to argue. And in general, we can also say that if and only if doesn't imply a because, but as we have seen, a dependency does. So dependency is directional and um, is asymmetric and explanatory. And 
a theory that is like based on this equivalent schema working with a biconditional seems to have this, this problem of directionality. So we can also um, uh, motivate the problem for minimalism from a different angle. We can say that we know that according to minimalism, true is not a substantive property. We know that true, the predicate true is merely an expressive device. As we know, true allows us to use blind descriptions. If I don't remember what Bill said yesterday, right? He, I don't need to use a, a whole disjunction like he said, uh, grass is green and grass is green, or he said snow is white and snow is white and so on. I don't need like this infinite list, but rather I can use true to just say what Bill said yesterday was true. So we, this is an example that shows that true has an expressive device, or we also know that true allows us to make generalizations like everything Einstein said is true instead of like naming all the things he has said, I can just use true to generalize. And as we also know, uh, minimalism is based on this idea that if the truth predicate only has an expressive device, we also are allowed to conclude that truth is not a substantive property. It's like um, a logical property. Now, as I said, we can also motivate the problem of dependency in this way, because if truth is only an expressive device, then how can truth depend on reality? Right? It seems like truth has to be substantive enough to stand in some sort of like dependence relationship with reality. Now, uh, there are different possible responses to this issue. One possible response is what I call the easy solution. You just deny the correctness of the dependency intuition as a quotationalist or deflationist in general. Uh, a friend of mine, Jared Henderson, tried to do this in his dissertation, defended in 2019 at UConn, and J.C. Beale is also um, a proponent of this view. So if you have a transparency notion of truth like J.C. has, where you think that the truth predicate just works like the connect event, right? You can just, if you do a deduction, you can just introduce uh, and and eliminate it. So if you have that kind of view of the truth predicate, the transparent view, then it looks like, well, you shouldn't really care about the dependency intuition. At least this is something that J.C. Buell has proposed to me. And it's really interesting because I wasn't really acquainted with this kind of view. But there's this view of like just denying the, the correctness of the dependent in intuition. That's one way to go. Um, the literature that I'm acquainted with, and there's quite a bit of this, is actually the one that takes the dependency intuition seriously. And again, there are two ways one could take here. One could just deny that the minimalist or deflationist in general can account for dependency. Crispin Wright does that, Wolfgang Kühne does that, and so on. A lot of people or other people are trying to give a minimalist slash deflationist account of dependency. Horwich has that view, and this is widely discussed in the literature. Um, more recent views defended by Andrew Thomas, by Stefano Caputo, by Julian Dodd. And I am going to be working with the second group of views with 2A and 2B. And in um, particular, I'm going to look at deflationist solutions to the dependency problem. And I'm going to suggest my own view, which is supposed to be a deflationist view. So there's the pragmatic solution, which is inspired by Grice, which suggests, look, we can conversationally implicate dependency, although we cannot state it explicitly if we work with the biconditional, which is bidirectional and non-explanatory in general. I'll say more on this. Then there is also the conceptual explanation solution. Julian Dodd is a proponent of this. This view is inspired by Schneider, who has general ideas about what a conceptual explanation is instead of a metaphysical explanation. And Dodd thinks that although a metaphysical view is not available to the minimalist, a conceptual one is available. But I'll say more on that. Then there's a Horwich's widely discussed uh, view, which I call deductive nomological, because Horowitz tries to get a direction from world to truth by starting with um, the laws of nature and the initial conditions of the universe, how we get from there to snow is white, and then we can employ minimalism 
to get a dependency claim. I'll say more on that too. And then finally, I will also discuss my own view, which I call piecemeal definitional. So there are at least two parts. There's the part that there's only one by one dependency and this seems like totally in sync with, uh, with a deflationist picture. I think nobody would um, object to that, but I'm happy to hear more later. And there's the definitional aspect, and this is in inspired by Tarski, where he says that um, an instance of the equivalent schema is a partial definition of truth. And um, I think that's how I will suggest to get an explanatory symmetry in the internal to the biconditional by treating this as a partial definition. I will explain how this is going to be um, compatible with minimalism or deflationism in general. So let's start by Thomas's pragmatic approach. As I have said earlier, he says that a dependency doesn't have to be stated explicitly. Not only it, it can be stated by implicating it, but it doesn't have to be stated explicitly. So here's, first of all, a mundane example of implicating conversationally, where you can implicate a because relation. So Gil asks, why is Fred giving his entire month's wages to Oxfam? And Jack responds, Fred only gives money away if there's something in it for him. Thomas says, well, if we um, buy the idea that Grice proposes that when people interact with each other, normally they're trying to be cooperative and to react to what they are saying and provide information that is useful, then it looks like that there's this in implicature here that Fred gives his money away because there's something in it for him. So as we can say in what's said is that somebody gives money away if there's something in it for him. But given the setup of the why question, we are allowed to think that because relation is implicated here. And Thomas thinks that we can do the same in the case of a truth dependency on reality. Here's his scenario. Out of philosophy student asks his deflationist friend, why is the proposition snow is white is true? His friend responds, well, the proposition snow is white is true just in case snow is white. So this is a just in case instance of the equivalent schema. He says, Thomas says, well, since we ask an why question, and this is the answer we get, we provide an instance of the equivalent schema, we are allowed to conclude that we have an implicature here, namely the implicature that the proposition snow is white is true because snow is white. So this is like this pragmatic context, contextual approach. And as I have already mentioned, um, um, if we think that people are trying to give information that's relevant, and there's also this Gracian maxim formulated, which is called relation, which says be relevant. So Thomas concentrates on this maxim to like motivate his approach. And there's also this general condition on implicating conversationally provided by Grice, which says that if a person A says that P, and if the supposition that Q is required to make A saying that P consistent with the presumption that A is observing the conversational maxim, then A has conversationally implicated that Q. So if our Q is, um, if we go back to the earlier slide, that snow is white is true because snow is white. We need that to make sense of the conversation. And if that's needed to make sense of uh, people interacting with each other in a sensible way, then we are allowed to conclude that somebody has implicated that Q. So has implicated in our case a because relation. Okay, here's my objection to um, um, Thomas, there are quite a bit of objections. I think here's the one I would like to concentrate on. I think he misses the target. Obviously, our target is an instance of the equivalent schema in a non-conversational context. What we need is a directionality internal to the instances of the equivalent schema. The minimalist theory of truth is far removed from any particular explanatory context, right? Our theory of truth are the instances of the equivalent schema, which are axioms of the theory of truth. Now, uh, Thomas is right that if you, have, if you get the directionality external to it, right, then you can use an instance of the equivalent schema to implicate, as he says, directionality. But I don't think that that's what, what our initial problem was. 
So Thomas says the reason that instances of VR are asymmetric in the sense that they implicate a dependence of truth on reality and not vice versa is because they are offered in the context of an explanation of truth, not in the context of an explanation of reality. Again, by context of an explanation of truth, he means that yes, he, uh, the deflationist friend is asked, why is the proposition knows why it is true and that's how the pragmatic approach gets us this um because relation but i think that this obviously misses the target and i want to motivate my claim that we need a directionality internal to the instance of the equivalent schema so I think one way to do it is just to point out that uh, implicatures can be cancelled. So here's a quote from um, Grice on that. I, I, I don't want to read everything, but I just wanted to show that he says that, that a conversational implic implicature can be cancelled in a particular case that's in red. And then he says it may be explicitly cancelled by the addition of a clause that states or implicates that the speaker has opted out. So I'm going to cancel the implicature to show that we, what we need is a directionality internal to, to the biconditional because as minimalists, we can put forth the biconditional, right? We can do it in a way that we don't compromise minimalism but cancel the dependency claim and that's a problem for the pragmatic view. So here's what I have in bold added to uh, the response earlier. So let me start with the question again. Add a philosophy student asks his deflationist friend, why is the proposition snow is white true? And adds deflationist friend response, well, the proposition snow is white is true, just in case snow is white. And then we can add, that's all I have to say about the truth of snow is white. I don't mean to implicate or even imply that truths depend on reality. To the contrary, when I say that the proposition snow is white is true, just in case snow is white, I am only denominalizing, only peeling off the angle brackets. So that's a fair deflation is response. Later we will see that I myself think that denominalization and dependency are compatible with each other and that's part of my approach. But here I just wanted to show that we can cancel out the dependency claim while maintaining minimalism. Yes, that's what the slide is saying. Even when Ed invites an explanation by asking a why question, his minimalist friend can explicitly resist invitation without in any way compromising minimalism, right? We still state our equivalent schema or the instance of it and fully articulate minimalism while explicitly denying the dependency claim. And here's just evidence that Horwich says that the truth predicate serves merely to restore the structure of a sentence. It acts simply as a denominalizer. And in order for us uh, to see that it has that function, we must acknowledge the instances of the equivalent schema and that there's nothing more about truth that needs to be assumed. Okay. Now, there might be a more charitable reading of Thomas, the reading that, I mean, he shows something, right? He shows that the instances of the equivalent schema, in fact, can be used in a conversational context for us to express our acceptance of the dependency intuition. So it's fair to say that Thomas might have shown that the deflationist can employ the instances to express the acceptance of the dependency intuition. But the problem is that the instances of the equivalent schema can also be employed to express one's acceptance of the converse intuition, namely that reality depends on truth. And that's, of course, a problem again, because that shows that the pragmatic approach fails. So imagine a community of anti-realists who are also deflationists. They infer from what they hold as true to how the world is. They think that because the proposition snow is white is true, snow is white, now suppose the anti-realist deflationist friend asks why is snow white? Now we are interested in understanding why snow is white and not why snow is white is true. The anti-realist deflationist responds, well, the proposition that snow is white is true is necessary and sufficient for snow's being white. That is, snow is white is true if and only if snow is white. So here, according to Thomas's line, we are implicating that snow is white because snow is white is true, right? If, if we were able earlier to use an instance of the equivalent schema to implicate that 
snow is wide is true because snow is wide, now he, we are able to implicate the converse intuition. And, and that shows that the pragmatic uh, approach fails. Yeah, this is just a summary that the uh, pragmatic approach fails mainly for two reasons. Implicates can be canceled and biconditionals can be employed two ways. Now, let me uh, look at, let us look at Dodd's, Julian Dodd's conceptual explanation solution to the issue. So he says that the dependency intuition is compatible, compatible with minimalism where the intuition is understood in a conceptual, not metaphysical way. So, and conceptual explanations are based on conceptual truths. Now, first we are trying to understand what makes an ex um, explanation conceptual rather than metaphysical. Here's a mundane example of an explanation. I call it color. This vase is colored because it is red. This is an example he discusses. He says, well, the, the, what makes this explanation conceptual is that we are not trying to explain in metaphysical terms why the vase is colored, why col the term color applies here. Rather, we are just using the conceptual truth. If something is red, then it is colored. So this conceptual truth is the basis for color and that, and that makes color rather conceptual than a metaphysical explanation. Now we need to understand what, how the conceptualist gets an explanatory asymmetry. So what makes something an explanation in the first place? And here they talk in terms of a decrease in com conceptual complexity. The idea is that the proposition that follows because is conceptually more primitive than the one on its left-hand side. So in color, we had, let me go back to color. The idea is that um, this vase is colored. That proposition is conceptually more complex than uh, the proposition or sentence it is read. And in, in particular, Dodd says that conceptual primitiveness in this color case comes down to the fact that the concept red is the kind of concept one has to possess if one is to possess the concept color. So he, here he gets an asymmetry uh, by the idea that one concept is needed for having the other concept. Okay, now let's look at, uh, at the truth case to understand what makes an example like truth, like Sue is drowsy is true because Sue is drowsy, a conceptual rather than metaphysical explanation. Again, the idea is that it's based on a conceptual truth. Here our conceptual truth is that the proposition Sue is drowsy is truth and only Sue is drowsy. So now we have explained the conceptual but why we are not engaging on a metaphysical level. But unlike before where we had a conditional here we have a biconditional. So let me go back. Before we had a, this condition, if something is red, then it is colored. So here we might have like a direction already, but here we have the biconditional, which is bidirectional. Now um, we need to still understand what makes his explanation, uh, what makes truth an explanation in the first place. And the idea is as before, in the color case, the idea is that the proposition on the left-hand side of truth is more complex than the proposition on the left hand, uh, on the right-hand side. He says a proposition involving a more elaborate concept, in this case truth, is explained by a proposition that is conceptually less complex. Now, uh, the, the question that I'm interested in as a deflationist is can the deflation is accept that the left hand side of truth is conceptually more complex than its right hand side? What exactly does that mean? And I would like to motivate the importance of this question by looking at different deflationist attitudes towards the concept of truth. It's not always clear what they think, or at least it's not clear whether there is like a consensus. But suppose you take Frege to be a deflationist you would do so because in the thought he says that the two sides of the equivalence schema have the same sense. So that suggests that there is no conceptual complexity between the two sides of the equivalence schema, at least 
if by conceptual complexity we're interested in in a complexity in content if the two sets have the same meaning then they seem to be conceptually on the par with respect to their meaning and their content now we also have field who says something like that the two sides of the equivalent scheme are cognitively equivalent and he has a very specific understanding of cognitive equivalence namely that p is true and p have the same inferential roles so like if i get from p to q then i also get from p is true to q is true so the idea is that p is true and p have the same inferential roles and um, it looks like this doesn't motivate the thesis that true adds conceptual content so true cannot be conceptually more complex than uh, the concepts on the right hand side of truth because right like at least what field says or what frege said it's, it's not motivated by what deflationists think about the concept of truth now um dot works particularly with uh, minimalism but also minimalism doesn't seem to give us a conceptual complexity here or which says if you learn the concept of truth what you learn is its expressive function i mean i should be clear that's not what he literally says but i am ascribing it to him that that's something he would hold and as we also know horwich thinks that the grasp of the concept of truth consists in the disposition to accept the instances of the equivalent schema a priori right if if i give you an instance of the equivalent schema you are inclined to just accept it it seems tri trivial right you are going to accept it a priori and you have this disposition to do so and that's all grasped of the concept of truth consists in so also this doesn't seem to motivate the idea that true is somehow more elaborate a more elaborate concept than the concept that you have on the right hand side of a because claim like truth now it's interesting that dot himself has agrees that the two sides of the equivalent schema are equivalent cognitively equivalent but nevertheless he thinks that there's some sort of complexity going on and to understand what he has in mind i think this quote is helpful he says the reason why it is the proposition p is true because p and not its converse that is correct is that the right hand side of truth although both intentionally and cognitively equivalent to the left hand side is conceptually similar in a way familiar from our discussion of color so here the trick to understand him is to really look into the analogy between color and truth to understand what he has in mind with conceptual complexity so again in the case of color we saw the way we get an explanatory asymmetry is via conceptual complexity and we saw that conceptual complexity just means that red is the kind of concept that one needs to possess in order to possess the concept of color and that's why there is this um, difference in conceptual complexity between the two sides of color and um, it looks like this suggests what I have labeled a priority in concept possession. What I mean about with that is that, yes, uh, you first need a con the concept of red or something. It could be red, green or whatever. You need a particular color concept first before you have the more abstract concept, color concept. And, and that gives you um, conceptual complexity. And it looks like this is also what he thinks uh, is the case in, in the truth case. He says, since mastery of the concept of truth consists in our ability to relate statements involving it to statements involving only conceptual resources already at hand, the right-hand side of an instance of P is true because P counts as conceptually simpler than its left-hand side. So yeah, it seems, if I understand him correctly, here too, the left-hand side of truth is conceptually more complex than its right-hand side in the sense that you already possess concepts like snow and whiteness when you come to grasp that snow is white is true. So again, conceptual complexity is based here on some sort of priority um, in concept possession now i think the problem still is that there are also a lot of dissimilarities between the concept of color and the concept of truth 
that put the burden on the conceptualist to explain why that one feature of commonality, like maybe there's some commonality in concept possession and priority of concept possession, why is that sufficient to think that the truth predicate or the concept of truth works like the concept color, especially in a deflationist context. That's the surprising bit for me. So here are some conceptual differences between color and true. Color is more abstract than red, but in which sense can we say that truth is more abstract than snow whiteness? Another point that I wanted to bring up is that color is, seems to be a substantive explanatory concept. I mean, at least it can be very easily motivated as such when people, for example, in the philosophy of mind debate whether the concept is mind dependent or mind independent. It looks like there's something substantive about that concept, something that requires explanation. But as a deflationist, we are taking the concept of truth not to be a substan substantive explanatory concept. There's nothing to explain about truth or the concept of truth, right? That, that's a very basic deflationist line. Another disanalogy is that color is not a logical concept, does not denote a logical property. Color is a, an ordinary concept, denotes an ordinary property, even if it's a very difficult one to understand, but that even more suggests that it's a substantive concept. Whereas as deflationists, we take true just to be a device of denominalization, an expressive device, so truth is a logical concept, denotes a logical property. So again, there are this conceptual analogies between the two concepts, and I think that puts the burden on the conceptualist. And there's also uh, the general problem that, as I've said before, quoting uh, Aristotle, that dependency is a cross-categorical relationship between truth and world. But as a conceptualist, we're addressing the dependency intuition only indirectly, talking about conceptual relationships. And I think that's dissatisfying. And let's also keep in mind that even if there were no disanalogies between the concepts color and truth, suppose, we would only get a conceptual asymmetry, not a metaphysical one, since the very point of this approach is that we are avoiding the metaphysical one level and escaping on the conceptual one. But again, this seems dissatisfying, right? Because the original dependency intuition is a cross-categorical metaphysical intuition. And even if we give a, a, the analogy up to the concept color, still, if we want to be conceptualist, right, we are still on the conceptual level. So I think all of this speaks against the conceptualist. Now let me look at Horridge's deductive nomological approach. Horridge's uh, approach is to deduce an explanatory asymmetry. And there are two steps. There's the deductive nomological step involving the laws of nature and the initial conditions of the universe to deduce why to explain why snow is white and there's this mere logical logical deductive step involving a particular instance of the equivalent schema say snow is white is truth and only if snow is white and snow is white and then you deduce snow is white is true so Horridge himself says and this is also quoted in his 2008 and 2009 paper. In mapping out the relations of explanatory dependence between phenomena, we naturally and properly grant ultimate explanatory priority to such things as the basic laws of nature and the initial conditions of the universe. From these facts, we attempt to deduce and thereby explain why, for example, snow is white. And only then, invoking the minimal theory, do we deduce and thereby explain why snow is white is true. So there are two deductions here. The first one is a deductive nomological one. And in two instances, Horry says, we don't only deduce, but we also explain. So once we explain why snow is white and we invoke the minimal theory, we also explain why snow is white is true. Now, I think there are some problems with this view, and apparent problem seems to be that logical deduction doesn't imply explanation, right? And this has also been mentioned by Rodrigo Pereira. We don't explain why the proposition snow is white is true by deducing it from snow is white and snow is white is true and only if snow is white, right? We can deduce that snow is white is true, but do we 
thereby explain it. I mean, we need more argument to, to explain why logical deduction is supposed to imply explanation. It looks like only the first deductive nomological step is explanatory involving the laws of nature and the initial conditions. Right there, we have an explanatory step, but it looks like the second logical deductive step is not, or at least I want to argue for this. And uh, I, what Ligon says is helpful to make that point a bit clearer. So he, he focuses on the fact that a biconditional is two ways. He says, okay, suppose we, we do get a because claim, as Horwich says, just by employing the instance of the equivalent schema and having snow is white, and then we get to snow is white, snow is, white is true, right? That's a valid deduction. And suppose we have a because relation here. He says, well, since a bicondition is uh, two ways, we can also deduce in a valid manner snow is white, employing the, the schema. So, but now it looks like Horowitz does not have an account, this deductive approach does not have an account of the dependency intuition, right? Because the dependency intuition is asymmetric. The point is that P is true because P is good, but uh, P because P is true is bad. But it looks like on Horwich's approach, using the second step, we can deduce uh, the converse in intuition that we are actually denying. Uh, Wright has also uh, a known um, objection to Horwich. So Ligon is concentrated on, on the biconditional, the second step of deduction, right? Rather is concerned with the first um, deductive nomological step. And he says, look, if there's this equivalence between Snow is White is true and Snow is White as uh, Orwich would claim, then the deductive nomological explanation is also an explanation for why Snow is White is true. And, and that's a problem because now we are not locating an explanatory direction from Snow is White to snow is what is true. But this is what we were interested in. We were interested in how minimalism can account for the fact that um, P is true because P is correct, but um, the other way around not. So the, the explanatory bit is located in the wrong place, so to say. Okay. Summary, what Horwich needs to do is to explain how a biconditional can be explanatory. That was my point or Rodrigo Pereira's point. Uh, how we get rid of the two-way valid deduction, a related point, and how we avoid what I call explanation transfer. How we avoid that the explanation for why snow is white is true is in the wrong place, namely it's the deductive nomological step rather than located in the biconditional, which was our initial problem. So I want to show now that I have an account that, uh, that locates an explanatory symmetry internal to the biconditional because I take this to be the main issue and I have tried to motivate why this is important. So what I call the piecemeal definitional approach has three components. One component is that we get the explanatory symmetry between the two sides of an equivalent schema via partial definition of truth. I'll say more on that. But the point, the main point here is that directionality is a matter of the definition, definitional status of an instance of the. So I'm not trying to deduce an explanatory asymmetry. I'm not trying to get a conceptual asymmetry. I'm saying that we get a, a metaphysical sort of directionality in terms of partial definitions of truth. I'll say more on that. Another component of my theory, since I am a deflationist and a minimalist in particular, is that the dependency relation itself is deflated in terms of denominalization or disquotation. Depends on what kind of deflationist you are. And there's this third piecemeal part to my approach that yes, we are only addressing as deflationists, we are only addressing each propositional sentence individually. Just as deflationists, we think there's no general property of truth, we also should say that there is no general dependency relation. So if the truth of the proposition snow is white is a matter of snows being white, then the dependency of the proposition's truth on reality is also only a matter of its relation to snow is 
snows being wide, and so on for each position. Okay, now comes this uh, Tarski motivated part or inspired part. So let's look first at Tarski's T schema, access, truth, and only P, where P is to be replaced by any sentence of the language to which the word true applies, and X is replaced by a name of the sentence in question. I could also put here the equivalent schema that I'm working with, but yeah, I, I want just to make clear that my view is um, motivated by Tarski. I have to give Tarski credit and in particular what's interesting for my purposes is the quote below where he says that um, that neither the expression t itself nor any particular instance of the form t can be regarded as a definition of truth. We can only say that every equivalence of the form t obtained by replacing P by a particular sentence and X by a name of the sentence may be considered a partial definition of truth, which explains wherein the truth of this one individual sentence content consists in. So this is the part that I'm interested in. It's the, the piecemeal part and it's the definitional part that I think we can use to get an explanatory symmetry. So first of all, there's like a, call it a formal symmetry because um, I am looking at an instance of the equivalent schema as one where on the left hand side we have a definium, definiendum, the truth of snow is white. And on the right hand side we have a definion, snow is white. And in particular, since we are giving a definition, the sentence in the role of the definions specifies the worldly condition under which a particular sentence or proposition is true. So that, 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 that makes my view metaphysical. I'm interested in um, what, I'm interested in the worldly condition that the right-hand side specifies. And now if we say something like the truth of the snow is, uh, of the proposition snow is white consists in snow is being white and the truth of roses are red consists in roses being white and so on. My claim is that by given a partial definition, by having we do have dependency and explanatory asymmetry in that way because if uh, the truth of snow is white consists in snow being white, then it's fair to say, hey, um, snow is white is true because snow is white and so on. So we get the explanatory, explanatory asymmetry in virtue of given a partial definition of truth. Now, as a deflationist, I'm rejecting a thick relationship between world and truth, right? I'm not working with grounding and correspondence theory. I cannot do that. For me, the association of the particular truth and question with the worldly condition is thin. So again, we, we need the definition part to get an explanatory symmetry. And now we need to address the dependency relationship as such. And I do that in virtue of denormalization. So the relevant association for me is thin. It gets into the picture via denormalization. What is denormalization de again? Well, when we make a truth description, we're only peeling off the angle brackets, or as Horridge himself says, restoring the structure of a sentence. And now the metaphysical bit of my view comes in because the restored sentence specifies a worldly condition. So I'm trying to give a metaphysical account that's compatible with deflationism that also gives us the asymmetry via the definitional aspect of my approach. Now I think there are uh, advantages of my approach over the other approaches. So let's begin with the pragmatic approach. Um, as we have seen, the anti-realist deflationists can employ the instance of uh, E to implicate that reality depends on truth, and there was a problem, right? Because that just shows that the pragmatic approach fails to get the dependency intuition that we need. But on my approach, we have an explanatory asymmetry internal to the instances of E, since we're taking an instance of E to be a partial definition of truth. So I'm not getting the, the directionality from context. I am trying to establish one internal to the instance of the equivalent schema. So, so for me, there is no problem of yeah, implying or implicating that reality depends on truth. I don't have that problem. 
Now, one might say that, hey, all of that sounds good, that partial definition approach sounds good, but look, um, why would we accept in the first place that an instance of the equivalent schema is a partial definition? I could imagine somebody saying that. But even if somebody would say that, at least for the purposes of showing that I have an advantage over the pragmatic approach, I can also say, look, since the instances of the equivalent schema are axioms of the minimalist theory of truth and not reality, right? I'm only working with the minimalist theory. We already have an asymmetry even before introducing the notion of partial definition of truth to get an explanatory asymmetry. And I think this is a clear advantage over the pragmatic approach. So, right, if they are different sorts of biconditionals, our minimalist biconditional has a truth description on the left and it doesn't have one on the right. That's already an asymmetry in the form itself. And uh, the left hand side talks uh, uh, about sentences, but like the, or propositions, but the right hand side talks about the world. So we already have, on my approach, we already have an asymmetry before we introduce the notion of partial definition to get the explanatory asymmetry. So my view also has advantages over the conceptual explanation approach. Dot's how, conceptual you, how much more time do you need? You're at time, but we can take some out of the Q&A. Ballpark? I'm almost done now. I mean, I only have like three or four slides. I'll go quickly, okay. like four or five minutes at most. Thank you very much, sorry. Seven. Yeah. So uh, on God's conceptual explanation approach, we can at most account for a conceptual dependency relationship between the two sides of the equivalent schema, right? As we have seen, we can say that the proposition or sentence snow is drowsy involves the kinds of concepts one needs in order to understand snow is a uh, serious drowsy is true. But on my approach, we maintain the metaphysical character of the dependency, because for me, the relationship between explanandum and explanans is one between particular truths and pieces of the world. For me, on the partial definition approach, the truth of particular sentence or proposition consists in a worldly condition. And I have said, once we have a notion of consists and we thereby also have dependency metaphysical dependency, that was the important point. I also think that there are advantages uh, over Horwich's deductive nomological approach. Since on my approach, we don't work with deduction, but we work with partial definition, we are not required to explain, which is a difficult job, how deduction implies an explanatory symmetry. There might be biconditionals that are explanatory, something like, um, an action is morally right if and only if it maximizes utility, that might be one of those. But in general, there's nothing inherent to a, a deduction or a deduction that involves a biconditional that gets you an explanatory symmetry. So, and I'm avoiding that problem because on my approach, we get a, a symmetry and explanatory ex asymmetry in which you are asking what the truth of a particular sentence or proposition consists in. And we do it in a piecemeal way, the truth of snow is white, consistent snow is white, and so on for each proposition. So in my view, we have an exponential asymmetry in trial to the biconditional. Right, just let me mention that thereby also um, avoid Ligon's objection. I mean, why does Ligon's objection work? We have seen that the problem is that the biconditional can be employed in two ways. So it looks like we are not only deducing the dependency intuition that we need, that we're interested in, but also the converse intuition. But since I am saying that I have a directionality internal to the biconditional, the directionality we need, because I'm talking about what the truth of a particular sentence consists in, I am avoiding, I'm not subject to uh, Ligon's criticism. Okay, this is my last slide. And uh, yeah, I think also that I have also a good response to write because again, on the explanatory, on my view, we have an explanatory asymmetry internal to the biconditional. So there is no need to invoke the law, invoke the laws of nature and the initial conditions of the universe to get a direction from world to truth because I already have one in the biconditional by invoking the notion of definition. So as a result, we can also say 
uh, to write that we don't have to accept that the connection between Snow is White is true and the laws of nature and the initial conditions of the universe. He's right, there is still that connection. But the point is that on my approach, that, that connection is not mm, due to a mere equivalence between the two sides of uh, E-Snow, so the uh, Snow instance of the equivalence schema, because for me, there's an asymmetry. So I'm saying that I, I get the connection between the laws of nature and Snow is White is true, right? Okay, to, um, to sum up, yeah, I would say that, <laughs> that my approach is the best approach on the table. Uh, it can account for the cross-categorical metaphysical character of the dependency relationship while being compatible with minimalism. Denormalization played a big role here. And it can account for an explanatory asymmetry while being compatible with minimalism via the definitional status of an instance of the equivalent schema. And I think these are reasons to prefer my deflationist approach to the others. Thank you.